How can you do all that needs done in life and still pursue your desire to learn French or the guitar or grow a plant or make art? You can't put a fiddle under your pillow and wake up playing it, though how cool would that be? But one thing we can do, no matter how chaotic and overwhelming life can be, is know that every tiny small motion in the direction of those endeavors really do matter. And not only that, they add up over time with great momentum. Join me, Annie Fane Barillon, as I interview painters and gardeners, designers and musicians, photographers and cooks, creative livers of any kind, who have somehow, in the middle of it all, continued on their creative paths, no matter what. This is Fane House Radio, and I'm so glad you're here. Hi, well, my name is Elizabeth Garlington. My teaching practice and experience in mental health counseling have always been coupled with my visual art making. So I've always coupled money with play, play with money, or I wouldn't do it. And my father, I grew up with a very um, interesting, bombastic, demonstrative father who, who said, you know, play hard at work, work hard at play. So I've never, I've never not incorporated play into my practice as an artist. And I I really believe that's the real dearth with a a lot of people as studio artists is they forget play, play. There's so much pressure as artists with galleries and representation and commission splits and production lines that if I focused on that aspect of my artistry, I would become so overwhelmed. I would be um, incapacitated. How would you describe the main mediums that you work with today? Multimedia, fabric, beads, buttons, thread, uh, wax linen that I learned from you. Mostly fabric as a substrate, but I also equally love paper and and handmade papers. Um, Anything can become a substrate in my art. And that's why I, I believe my work really is fabric collage or multimedia. What did you think about art and making things with your hands when you were a child? Really, I grew up with crayons in my cradle and books in my crib. My mother was an artist. Both my grandmothers were very accomplished visual artists. I was set up into my tree house with watercolors and sketch pads. So I remember uh, my mother teaching our neighborhood kids watercolor in our driveway. So I've never not had studio space. I grew up in that one big studio. So every space I look at is a studio space. And one of these major books in my life, and I think this has a lot to do with studio artistry, is a book called The French Touch. And it's a book by um, Daphne de saint Seve, And she looks at interiors as still life. So everything in my life has sort of had a French touch. It's everything as a still life. So I look at rooms as a still life. Even my studio space has to have some comportment of organization and aesthetic. I look at things, how they're composed, what's the texture, what are, what are the visual, you know, the principles of design with, with arranging furniture and art on walls and gallery spaces. So I think that in, in my childhood growing up with a mother who was a major designer and architect, I, I look at things very spatially. It sounds like you had 100% in total encouragement. <laughs> Yes. And, and hypercriticism from my mother. I got so good at what I was doing. I think she was shocked, actually. So I think there was some healthy uh, mother, daughter, eldest, eldest daughter competition, too, when I, when I became a lot more mature in my work in my 30s and 40s. It was an interesting dynamic, yes. You describe yourself as an impatient, intuitive person. And how does that play out in your artwork, would you say? I believe I'm impatient in that I'm so highly visual. I almost can visualize the end product of what I am crafting. An impatient in that I don't really rest in preliminary sketches and a lot of planning and a lot of um, fabric auditions and things like that. I'm impatient in that I can see the work way ahead of time, but then my challenge is holding back and and being a little more soulful and a little more kind to myself because when I'm impatient I get into this production type mentality. 
you've talked about, it's almost like you're mixing your intuitive self with an impatience. It doesn't seem to me that the impatience is a negative thing. It's more about how it, it flows into your work. And like you're saying, you just want to get in there and do it. You don't really want to make like 10 samples first and that kind of thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and I always want to, I always want to move on to the next project. It's a huge dichotomy between planning a project or intuitively diving into it. So that's sort of a dichotomy I've struggled with. I've had a lot of commissioned work in my lifetime. Um, I probably complete probably eight to 10 big fiber works a year, which pretty much they're at high price points. The rest of that time is left for play and just me exploring and experimenting with materials and kind of pushing myself. But I think that regardless, my learning style, I'm very abstract, random. I'm not a concrete, sequential individual. And a lot of my experience as an educator, I apply educational psychology to my life as an artist. But always at the heart of what I do is the focus on excellent technical skill and fine craft. You're talking about intuition. Does that come into play more when you feel stuck, you're not sure what next step to take, and you just kind of relax and take a look at it, see what seems to be pulling you the strongest or color choices, or is that how you kind of design is in an intuitive way? I probably create a lot of the foundational images on a fabric substrate on, on you know, my blank canvas, which I quilt and then I collage. But then, okay, let's let's look at this image. Oh, this image needs more impactful color. Oh, let's move something over to the diagonal. And so it's sort of like a puzzle, you know, with collage. And quilts are collage. Everything to me is collage. It's little bits of bits everywhere that come together. But my process can change with 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 the project. But I really do love collage. It's influenced my entire life, no matter what it is. We know, obviously, there are so many mediums out there. There are so many things to choose from. Shall we choose blacksmithing? Shall we choose food? Shall we choose wool? Why do you think you love fabric so much? I love fabric because I can bend it, tear it, wrinkle it, iron it, straighten it. Um, I can order it online from a very a couture fashion house if I need to. I mean, if I if I have the means and the desire, I can find the most beautiful silks or Pierre Fay fabric at 300 a yard, or I can go to Walmart and buy muslin for $1.75 a yard. So to me, it can be dyed by natural plant materials, or I can bleach it out. I mean, to me, it, it kind of moves with me. I've often reversed the, the fabric, like I use the backside of fabrics a lot of times. Now I'm experimenting with a lot of linens. I've tried eco printing and at just hasn't caught my heart for some reason. I think probably because I'm very quick and I need immediate process, not I don't want to look at the mortar and I don't want to steam it and I want I don't want to wrap it. And the processes to me that are very long and sustaining try my patience. And so I'd rather just buy beautiful red matter linen that's already that beautiful rich red color. So that's sort of the immediate satisfaction I get or the immediate gratification I get. I don't want to go through a lot of processes to, to get my materials ready to, to use and cut and design. You also talk about stitching as meditation. And of course, stitching by hand takes a good amount of time, but it sounds like it's the relaxedness of it that keeps you mm -hmm sticking with it, even though it does take, it is very labor intensive to stitch by hand that way. Yes, exactly. That's well said. And I don't, and I don't understand, it could be my age. I'm, I'm 62 years old. It's sort of maybe a, a, a maturation of my art making because I've always struggled with machines. And when I first met you with your book arts, I was almost jealous, jealous of the craft where you really are only relying on your hands to produce and make. And I have beautiful machines. I, I, I have three Berninas and I have a felting machine, embellisher machine. I have a serger. I mean, I have beautiful technical equipment, but when that technical equipment jams or something happens, it, it impedes my, my making time with, with the process. And so I think I, my struggle now is 
balancing the soulful act of handwork with the technical productivity associated with machine work. Both are authentic. Machine work has, was done in the mid 1800s. People were free motion quilting and, and machine quilting in the 1850s. And so the myth that quilts are not authentic unless they're hand done is, is very false. But it's, it's sort of how do I combine aesthetically handwork with machine connecting or machine piecing. And then that leads into if we're just making for ourselves versus making a business out of it. And that's a real struggle because in order to take all the time it takes to do it all by hand and then the amount of hours that takes. And then if that's what helps pay your bills, that's probably too many hours for what the cost would be. And I feel like you're really good at mixing creation for sale you know, where you got to kind of produce a little more quickly to, for that to make sense and mixing that with making artwork for yourself because you love it so much and it exactly. makes you happy. Exactly. You've talked about the difference between intent to make and waiting for inspiration, which is a big difference. This also connects to like whether we're paying our bills with it or just making a sweet life for ourselves with it. Can you talk a little bit about that? The idea of waiting for inspiration versus going in, sitting down, stepping up to the plate, no matter how you're feeling and creating kind of no matter what? Well, first, I'm going to say that the intent to make leads to becoming inspired to make. And I truly believe there's a discipline to art making. And I think there's another resounding myth out there that an artist is sort of a free wandering spirit. And, you know, when the inspiration Kind of hits me that I might think about, you know, working and I look at my craft as work, but it's also play at work. And even if I'm not in a place to turn on a sewing machine or thread a needle or look for the wax linen that I cannot find or where the paper go, or I'm always in my studio at least four hours a day. It could be reading a book. It could be cleaning up something. It could be you know, being with my three German shepherds in my studio and just being in there. And usually the place impacts my train of thought. I seldom have blocks with where I am in my making process because I do think the process is more important than the product. And the more I focus on process, the better the resulting product will be. And so when people ask me as an artist, well, what's your production line or you need a production line? I've struggled with that for probably 30 years and I'm not going to have a production line. I mean, my work is one of a kind. Look at the quilt on the wall as you would read it as a painting and it might, it's one of a kind. But the intent and inspiration, I can't wait for inspiration because like I said earlier, I'm too impatient. But also there's a discipline. I mean, I turn on my alarm early in the morning and I'm in my studio, whether I want to be or not. And so it's part of my work day. So it is work, but then I've got beautiful books and fabric, and there's always something to do or fix or learn. What does being in the flow mean to you? So flow is another, another educational psychology theory that I really have applied to both my students, my teaching, and myself. Flow theory was established by a psychologist by the name of Mihai Sitsumahai, who is from the University of Chicago. When I'm in flow, I have no sense of time with what I'm doing. When I'm in flow, my challenge level meets my ability level. And when I'm in flow, I have no sense of time, which means that I'm exactly where I need to be and I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing. When I'm stressed, when I'm stressed out, my ability level is beneath my challenge level. When I'm bored, my challenge level exceeds my ability level. So flow for me is this perfect balance of materials meet my ability, meet my product, meet my process. When I've been working with kids, a lot of special needs kids in my career as a teacher in special education, when they're in flow, their ability level has met their challenge level. Because I've always believed that a lot of um, negative behaviors exhibited by children were due to stress that their ability level did not meet their challenge level. And so I always believed it was my job to remediate and accommodate a child's needs to the task at hand. And I do that with myself. <laughs> so I love how you're connecting it rightly. So to general well-being. you studied art education, psychology, rehabilitation, counseling, expressive arts, therapy, 
And soon you're going to be offering consultations. And what would people expect in a session like that? And how do you think it would help them? Well, expressive arts therapy is is not production and producing to make a product, okay? So in expressive arts, we are engaged in a really very life-enhancing creative activity, which combines music with art, visual art, or music with therapeutic writing and journaling with visual art. So you're using a multimodal approach to the facilitation. So people can expect sessions that would involve written mandalas, because I think of the mandala as a shape and form as a very healing symbol. A stitch meditation or a program I called Healing Stitches, where you've got the rhythm of the handwork that creates some neutrality in one's emotional state. With kids, I do something called creative bags where I just have a lot of materials in a bag and they dump it out and they create something that's their idea, their problem solving, which, you know, comes back to what I believe artists really, we are solving a problem or we're solving a problem in a new way. And so with, I learned that in gifted education with children with very, very high, high IQs and they were kind of probably victims of their own giftedness. In other words, asynchronous development. Intellectually, they were far superior, but emotionally, they were still 10-year-olds, but they intellectually were very high on on their IQ scales. But they needed the challenge of solving the problem in a unique way. But in expressive arts um, and healing arts and arts and medicine, the arts are life-enhancing. And if there's some kind of clinicity in a hospital or school hallway or environment, You know, that's why art teachers put art in the hallways or hospital systems create art in in the cancer treatment centers. It reduces the clinicity of an environment. And so it it should be fun and play, not product oriented, but one on one sessions with people or group sessions. Oh, and with expressive arts, beautiful, beautiful materials that are often just dumped out on a table. I mean, people need choices, choices, choices with what they pick and choose from, and then they create their own studio space at their table. So that goes back to the French touch. Everywhere, anywhere anybody is, is their own studio space. I think sometimes whether it's an instrument or whether to pay a teacher to learn a language or our supplies, sometimes we'll try to save money in that realm um, and spend less on those things. And then you end up with not as good quality materials or your instrument's harder to play because it is not to par. And it really leads to frustration and it's really worth the money to set yourself up for success that way. Exactly. And that's what happened to me with my first sewing machine. I lived in Wilmington, North Carolina, newly married, no friends, no family, no job, walked into a quilting store. And here, this goes back to me loving fabric. And I was talked into taking a hand piecing course. Within three months, I had hand pieced four quilt tops, but I knew I was never going to hand quilt it because I'd never make the money, you know, per hour. I would never get it back. So my grandmother bought me a Bernina sewing machine. It was my first sewing machine. And the small Wilmington, North Carolina community was, you know, quilting community was like, she's new at this. She got a Bernina. And then, you know, it took the risk. I was juried into a museum exhibit six months after I got the Bernina and I won best in a quilting show and art quilting. I mean, so I dove in, probably made some people angry because my work was so different. It was not traditional quilting. It was art quilts, quilted collage. But yeah, the materials, if I had, if I had uh, settled for a $200 machine at C- from Sears, I would have broken it within two weeks and would never have touched it again. One project I've enjoyed hearing about, which is also something that you explain is also helping keep you sane during pandemic times, is this amazing, I've seen photographs and they are amazing, of a dollhouse that you were creating and adding to all the time to make your own self happy. And it's not for sale. It's not for anything other than that. And I think that's so beautiful. And I was wondering if you talk about it a little bit, including some of the details. Anyone who um, watches this video later will be able to see that it's behind you (laughs) on the screen. Yeah, my dollhouse. (laughs) The dollhouse adventure began 
When I was teaching in the early 1990s and a little girl with special needs was had to do a book report on the book by Roald Dahl, James of the Giant Peach. And she was just struggling. She wanted to do something. I said, okay, sweetie, I'll help you. So together, and she stayed after school with me. So together, we made a big peach out of paper mache, blew up a balloon and did paper mache. And then we creatively made twig furniture for her peach. And then my my little sister, Missy, had a dollhouse growing up. And I always thought my hands were too big to kind of, you know, manipulate or maneuver inside a dollhouse. But I've always have loved miniatures and collecting little things in boxes and putting things in containers. And the dollhouse, it's miniatures, they're manipulatives, it's block play, like little kids. But my expertise in some multimedia, you know, art making comes together with this dollhouse. So I mean, I'm distressed painting, I'm paper mache I'm creating faux finishes on walls. I'm thinking about myself very autobiographically. So the woman who lives in this house is an art history teacher. (laughs) She's got a big mess at her desk of all these drafts of her lesson plans. And she's got a big bottle of wine. (laughs) And then on the side, I've got an outhouse with, you know, the book by Tom Robbins, Even Cowgirls Get the Blues, and A Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Toole in a newspaper. I look at it kind of outside of myself, like, I can't believe I did this, you know, and it's lit, I have lights in it now, and I can turn it around for you. But it's just there's sort of this delightful play. And I know when I look at it, my blood pressure goes down because there's no expectation of me with it. I think that's the big stress that artists have are these external expectations of our working product and how much have you sold and tell me about your body of work. And it's this um, revenue generating enterprise, I think, really interferes with the actual process and creating expertise in a craft. And I'm not being disingenuous with people who are really good at their craft and they make a lot of money. I'm never going to be some people who really have big names. You know, that's not my goal. But I think a sense of play is very integral to what I do. And it takes the pressure off of me. And it helps me maintain an internal locus of control rather than external locus of control of pressure. And I'm probably somewhat rebellious or would not, I would not be doing what I did. I would probably still be teaching 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. as a teacher in the public school system, but I quit. I left that kind of life. The art being contained is something that I do in a studio, and I think it's symbolized in the dollhouse. It's fun because it's almost like you're creating your own delight your own delightful situation by working on this dollhouse. And it's also ongoing. You could always add and add and add to it like it's never over. And you talked about little boots that have the mud on the soles Mm -hmm. and you shrunk down images to put them on plates to create your own china. I mean, it's an amazing thing. And I love hearing about any project that makes somebody so happy. (laughs) It's probably a little bit more than play for me because I did start the dollhouse uh, when my mother, when I got obtained legal guardianship for my mother, and she was in stage Parkinson's disease and dementia. So the dollhouse also was a huge aspect of my grief process with my mother's dementia. And my mother was a designer and, you know, kind of cre- building the dollhouse was a very intentional process too, because I had to measure, I had to let glue rest and dry. I mean, it wasn't like my typical, oh, let's do collage and splatter and see what happens. But then I get back to square and then I apply principles and elements of design. But I think this was also, I think it was a very safe place for me to play and grieve. Thank you for sharing about that. I think it's a great encouragement for any of us out there to, you know, is valid time spent if it's making us so happy. And I know you've been working also on a website and that you're on Instagram. And um, if people are curious to see what you're up to, where can they find you? It's www.eagartquilts.com. And that's my fine art, fiber art website. And then I have a link to my second website, which is www.garlingtonexpressivearts.com. There's also descriptions of what expressive arts are. And I would hope that people, artists in our lives and in our communities, 
no matter what the art form from gardening to shearing sheep <laughs> to sweeping your kitchen floor, there's all an art to everything, can apply some of these philosophies to their own making time. And you relax and play and play with materials and take a risk and maybe take the idea that art does heal into their own lives as artists. Yes, for young and old. Yes. What is filling up your inspiration cup these days? Well, my inspiration cup is more of an intentional cup. I'm trying to combine my hand stitch work with machine work. And to me, that's a, it's a pretty big challenge and problem to solve. Like where does my hand work fit into the machine production work? Or am I going to machine piece a quilt back and then I'm going to apply or collage my hand stitch work on the surface of a machine piece quilt top? Or do I use African mud cloth or do it, is it become more art cloth than an art quilt? The definition of a quilt is three layers. Well, art cloth is just one layer. So Bisa Butler, B-I-S-A Butler, uh, she's an African-American artist, woman artist who just recently completed an, an exhibit of her quilts at, at Art Institute of Chicago. And she takes antique photographs and she enlarges them into huge, enormous portrait quilts. And the work is phenomenal. She was on the cover of American Craft Magazine recently. Just the work is so historically significant that it, it documents vis-a-vis -vis quilts history. And I think quilts are fabric documents. And, you know, the Underground Railroad, they were often called message maps. So, I mean, I think there's this wonderful urgency to quilts coming into the foray of contemporary craft and art and being more legitimatized as fine art, not craft. And that's another argument I know you've heard all your life, but I, I love it that the work is, it's big, it's loud, it's big enough to say something and the visual impact of her work is phenomenal. In closing, do you have any last words of encouragement for anyone out there trying to make and create and do in the middle of the chaos? Yes, and I made a list because that was a complicated question and answer. First one is become comfortable with ambiguity in response to both process and particularly product of your work. Create a sense of play in your making time. Maintain, nourish a sense of privacy and care of yourself in your studio space. The studios are our sanctuaries of self-care. Even when it's hard to create, make do. Even when it's hard, just go and sit quietly in your making space. Doing nothing always results in doing something. The quiet, inactive times are our creative hibernation fermentation process. Hibernation fermentation process. <laughs> I love it. If you would like to be in touch or have someone you would love to hear interviewed, email me at afainhouse at gmail.com. I also hope that you're inspired to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast. New episodes come out every other Tuesday. If you would like to watch these interviews in video form and are curious about the happenings of my little business called Fain House, where I paint and make art prints and gift cards from my watercolor originals, I'd love for you to sign up for my email list. When you do, you get a coupon for 10% off a one-time purchase in my Etsy shop and first dibs on my annual limited edition calendar printing. You will also be granted access to our free private Facebook group, which is the one spot you can watch these interviews. If this all sounds fun to you, go to your web browser and type bit.ly backslash Fainhouse to sign up. That's with a capital F and a capital H in Fainhouse. This is not a weekly newsletter, but rather a list of folks who are interested in hearing from me time to time. You can find this link, as well as links for each person I interview, in the show notes of each episode. I'm Annie Fain Barillon. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll leave you with a quote for the day. Your vision will become clear only when you can look into your own heart. Who looks outside dreams? Who looks inside awakes? Carl Jung. <laughs>